from Houston, Texas. Extracting the signal from the noise, it's the Cube. Covering Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing. Now your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Houston, Texas for the Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing. This is SiliconANGLE Media's The Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined with Jeff Frick, the general manager of The Cube. Our next guest is Lisa Dougal, who's the chief diversity officer for PwC Consulting. Uh, welcome to The Cube. Thank you very much. Uh, great to see you, great to chat with you. Before we came on, we were talking about you were at Carnegie Mellon back in the 80s, and we just had Eileen Fagan on from Intuit, another 80s throwback like me and Jeff. <laughs> so back to the 80s, hot tub time machine, whatever you want to call it, it's a lot of fun. Um, so thanks for spending some time with us. Oh, my pleasure. Um, so first, what are you working on? So that's the first question. We've learned that's a good question to ask. What are you working on? What am I working on? So for me personally, I do a number of different things, right? As my role as Chief Diversity Officer, I am creating and evolving and implementing programs that help all kinds of diversity in the workplace, which ranges from women to minorities to men as well, which is one of our big focus areas, right? Um, as a partner in the practice, I'm also a retail consumer partner. So I work with retail and consumer clients on transforming um, their businesses from strategy to execution. Digital transformation is hot right now. Absolutely. I mean, everything is being automated. I mean, everything's addressable now. Internet Every of Things creates 100% data acquisition. It does, but I think at the same time, it's created such a wealth of, I will call it information, old school, or data information terminology, processing. right? <laughs> I think companies are struggling with how do you parse through, how do you tell the story, how do you figure out, A, what the data is telling you. If you take the consumer industry, for one, right? They've got huge amounts of consumer data now. The question is, how do you use it? How do you turn it into innovation? One of the things you were mentioning before you came on was that you did a thesis at Carnegie Mellon back in the 80s where you were actually a computer science major, but everyone had to code, which is great, back in the 80s. Yeah, but maybe we should reinstitute <laughs> that across the university. I right? agree, I think, I think so. everything should code. It's like math and science. It's, to me, I think a requisite skill for everybody. But you said your thesis was decision making using computers. Now, fast forward to today, where we were just chatting about for the first time in modern, in business history, you can actually measure everything. So no more excuses. If you could actually measure everything. Right, so the question becomes, what do you want to measure, right? Yeah, so what does that do for the business? How does that change that, everything? And I think it's a combination of measurement, which is, looks historical, and that's important, right? With predictive, and right, where the world is going, it's predictive analytics, behavioral analytics, right? Because that enables us to figure out how we want to change. If we're only ever looking backwards, we right. get a static point in time, yeah. and that's informative and you need that. And as, as we talked before, you need to be able to parse through the data and decide which is relevant and which is really the lever you want to pull. But I think more and more we're seeing companies doing data modeling and data predictive analytics on just about everything, right? Right, and Merv Adrian loves to talk about data in motion. Uh, from Gartner, and, and you know, it's no longer good enough to have it, look at it, then decide what you're going to do. Now, really with Spark and some of the new technologies, you actually have an opportunity to look at the data in motion, in a transaction, in a retail environment, and change, change the transaction midstream to hopefully get to a better outcome. Absolutely. So I what mean, are you seeing kind of out in, in, the, in the world of some of these more advanced retailers and some of the things I, they're I working on? I think that's on? happening. I think the ability to drop coupons as people walk by the aisle, is more and more prevalent, right? Not just any coupons, but we know you buy a lot of milk, right? Um, yeah. I think you're going to see more and more price changing based on the consumer. I know you, you've been into my store, you're a loyal customer. I'll pop you the milk at this price where somebody else might pay a higher price. I think the world is um, open in terms of how these companies are using not just the data they collect on the products and the technologies, but also on you yeah. as the individual. Lisa, I want to get your thoughts on a concept that we've been kind of gleaming out of the data here at Grace Hopper and other events we've been to around women in computing, but more importantly, also computer science. And that there's a lot of different semantics. People argue about women versus ladies, this versus that. There's so many different you know, biases. I mean, I'm biased, whatever, all that stuff's happening. But one constant in all this is that there's two variables, uh, transparency and always learning. And that seems to be uh, a driver of a lot of change here. And you mentioned uh, digital transformation. What are you seeing out there that's really driving the opportunities uh, around transparency, you could say data access. If you have data, then things are transparent. 
always be learning, there's new opportunities. So those seem to be a big uh, pivot points here at this event here, where there's a lot of opportunities. But there's a subtle conversation of not just the pay thing and the gender equality on pay, but opportunities is the big theme we're seeing here. Absolutely, I am really energized by being here, right? First of all, to see so many young women all passionate about technology and computing and really being inserted in the right ways. You know, I've had women come up to me, even on the escalator, shake my hand and say, hello, you're from PricewaterhouseCoopers. Let me ask you what you do during your day, right? I think in my day, A, there was no place to go. <laughs> and even if you did, you were trying to navigate a very different world and you were trying to perhaps not be you, but be somebody else, right? How do you fit into the man's world? I used to watch all sports all weekend, so I can make sure I can participate in office conversation when I got in on Monday mornings, <laughs> right? Yeah. I think to hear the conversations that the women are having that are very technology driven, but also very much authentic to who they are, is where we're going. See, if you were a young uh, lady in tech, now you actually program the fantasy games to, so that you'd win the game every, every <laughs> yeah, that's often. right. You could write the code. <laughs> so, but there's a lot of coding, a lot of developers here. Phenomenal growth in developers. We just had a young girl just graduated. She's phenomenal, Natalia. And she got into it, she started in journalism major, and second year in, she switched into uh, computer science because she was tinkering with wearables. Which is terrific, right? One of the conversations I like to have with our young women about PwC in particular, but a lot of parts of the industry, is the ability to combine industry or sector knowledge with the technology, right? So I was talking to one woman who said, well, you know, I just switched out of pre-med, I really like medicine, but I got into coding, yeah, and yeah. I said, well, have you thought about yeah. you know, the whole arena of the healthcare industry is dramatically changing, right? We're moving to the point where we have you know, patient information, hospital information, drug trial information, and we can integrate all that. You could stay with healthcare and still do technology and coding, and she's looking at me like, she'd never thought about yeah, it's that, a revelation. Right? You it's, said it's earlier, a revelation. In the old days, you'd try to be someone else, try to fit into a man's world, but now you're seeing, you know, just the, just follow your passion and this technology behind it. Interesting enough, there's also an effect on the men. Like I had a Facebook post on my flight down here at the Wi-Fi on the plane, and I typed to my Facebook friends, hey, real question, is it politically incorrect to say I love women in tech? And I kind of put that out there as kind of a link bait, but all of a sudden, the arguments were, wait, politically correct, love is four versions of love. It's like all this argument. And one Getting very deep, and right? Getting very deep, but the one comment was, John, just be yourself. And I think, I tell our women that all the time, and, and all our people, right? But I think this, this shift to the workplace openness where you can be authentic. And I find often yeah. our young women in particular get guidance from mentors who are men, and they try to emulate that. And some of that is good, but you have to em emulate that while being authentic to who you are. Otherwise, you run that risk of perhaps being perceived inauthentic, or you know, it comes off a little bit too canned, yeah. right? What's your best advice to men? Because one of the things that we're seeing as a trend now, and certainly is that men inclusion is also into the conversation. It seems Absolutely. to be a big thing. We are doing that as a firm, both in the US and globally. We're a 10 by 10 impact sponsor for He For She, which is the UN's initiative with companies, governments, and not-for-profits to engage men in a conversation about raising awareness around women. And for us, it's women in the workplace, right? So there are really a couple of things I think men can do. One is listen and actively engage with the women. And not just women at your level, yeah. women who are millennials as well. If you can't, if you're not comfortable having that conversation, which I know many women, women and men both aren't, it's hard to yeah. put yourself in their shoes, right? The second is to really be an advocate, right? Think about when you walk into meetings, who's not in the room? Are the people looking all like you? <laughs> what do you do about that, right? And I think that the third is make it personal. You know, be involved and know what's going on and know how you can help. It, it seems so simple, right, when you just lay it out <laughs> there, right? Those are, those are not complicated concepts, but, but to put them in practice is, is, you know, it takes an active, you know, kind of thinking about it, right, it, to really make it have to impact change. It does, and I think more, it is natural for people to gravitate to people who are like them. Particularly in the workspace, we get very comfortable in our mm -hmm. own, let's call them echo chambers. And then you move with your echo chamber. And your echo chamber yeah. might have a little diversity, but likely it doesn't have a lot of generational diversity. It may or may not have all kinds of racial, ethnic, gender diversity. 
Um, and so you might meet somebody on the outside who's a little different, but you go back to your go-tos who are still in your echo chamber. So I think the yeah. goal is to get into multiple echo chambers, right? right? It's also, also comfort zone, right? I mean, people like what's familiar to them, and pushing the comfort zone barrier is one issue right now. Absolutely. Be uncomfortable. Be uncomfortable. Be comfortable in the Be, uncomfortable right. is how describe I like to say that. it. Describe that. Right? Describe what, what people should look for. I mean, and everyone has their own struggles and journeys. What, how so do often, people cope right, with that? So I often have this conversation with men. They say, well, how do I talk to women about being women? And I said, well, that's probably not the first conversation you should be having, right? Talk to them about who they are and what's important to you. And then the relationship, you have to build what we call familiarity, comfort, and trust. And once you've built that, you can have a conversation perhaps about what yeah. a woman's plans are if she's pregnant. Right. But you can't just walk in and that be the first. Out. Yeah, you can't blurt it out. Right, right. Yeah. Things, <laughs> things off. Uh, it's not a locker room. It's not a good icebreaker. Yeah. 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 So Lisa, you know, there's a lot of talk about what's the right thing to do and what, what does right mean? And clearly it's the right thing to do in terms of, of, of morally and, and, and as a human being to include people. But really, there's, there's a bottom line positive impact too. There's a better outcome impact. And, PwC, you guys do a lot of analysis, you work with a lot of companies. Are there some studies you can share, some, some facts or figures that you guys have discovered about how there's really great bottom line, better decisions, better products, better profitability, when you have a diverse point of view that you bring to a problem set? Absolutely, there are a number of different ways to look at that. I think you're right, it is the right thing to do, it's the moral thing to do, people want to feel good about it, but at the end of the day, we know that diversity is good for business performance, right? And there are a number of studies out there that talk about board composition and how, you know, now board, women on boards has been legislated in enough countries around the world for long enough now, you can correlate long-term 10, 15 year performance with the performance of those companies and we see that those companies perform better, right? Um, you can look at just the diversity. I mean, another angle of, of looking at it is we do a lot of work with millennials and the millennial studies, right? And the people coming off a of campus are more geographic, gender, ethnic, minority diverse than any generations we've seen in a very long time, right? There are more women coming off of campus in general than men right now and they're doing very well, right? So there's also the zero sum game that says if we don't figure out how to accommodate attract, promote, retain women, then we're not going to be able to get the best of the best of the workforce, and you become at a competitive disadvantage. Well, it's quality. That's the competitive advantage, is the quality that you get with the diversity. Absolutely. How do you manage that process? Because some would say diversity slows things down because you, you yeah. have different perspectives, but the output's higher quality. A higher quality and more innovation, yeah. right? And one of the things we like to do is talk about diversity in a number of different angles. So there's race, gender, sexual orientation. There's also, in our business, diversity of degrees. So we have coders working with MBAs, working with lawyers, doctors, strategists. And part of that is the way you get yeah. the best thinking and the most innovative solutions to your problems. And I think when you begin to develop and define it that way, there are places for more per people to get on the wheel, so to speak, right? right? Yeah, yeah. Everybody is thinking about diversity, not just you look different or you experience, but you bring a different perspective to the problem because you have a different background, where it's, you grew up and what you studied. Yeah, it's, it's, just, it's just funny that, you know, in being diverse, you're actually leveraging people's biases to get to a better solution. Absolutely. <laughs> Versus the other, other way around. <laughs> that's right. Other way around. And I think that there's a movement now, and we're really moving from thinking about being equal to thinking about being equitable, right? Equal would say if you have um, three kids peering over a fence, one's four foot, one's five foot, one's six foot. Give them all a one foot box. Well that's not going to get the four foot guy over the fence, right? What you really have to do is give them each a size box that they need, right? So the six foot kid probably doesn't need a box at all if it's a five foot fence, right? The five foot kid might need a little step stool and the yeah. forfeit kid probably needs a, a, a large queue, right? Yeah. right? That's being equitable, it's not necessarily being equal. Based on the outcome. Equal. Based, based on, on the outcome, Based absolutely. on the outcome right. of the objective. Right. Versus some statistical, equitable Correct, so I think formula. in business we're moving more to looking at that outcome-based equi equi being equitable, equitable across outcomes, equitable, thank you, not just being equal, because I think for a long term it was treat everybody the same and that's diversity it's really appreciate everybody for their dis differences yeah. and let them play to their strengths. Right, and use the data science tools available. GoDaddy put out the survey results of their salaries, 
too, you're seeing the uh, 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 University of Virginia professor, uh, Brian, gave a keynote today about the software that they're building in open source for tooling. Uh, but the data is going to be key. But at the end of the day, management drives the outcome objective. So Absolutely. as someone at a senior level who's had a good journey from the 80s, Eileen Fagan talked about the same thing. You're now at the top of the pyramid. The flywheel's developing. There's some good on in migration with women coming into the field. How's the balance, how's that flywheel working for the mentoring, the pipeline, and the operationalizing? I'll give you one example, right? So we have a women in technology. What started as a program, it's now a uh, part of our business, right? We started about two and a half years ago with 30 women who were trying to figure out in technology, you could be on long-term implementation projects for you know, six months, a year, two years, and only operate in the same echo chamber, right? So how do you network with other women? How do you meet them? It's now 1,400 people strong, and one of the pillars of it is a mentorship program. We had, and it doesn't sound like a lot, but see from where you start, yeah, right? <laughs> Increase of We percentage. started with needing, having about 50, 50 women mentored, right? We're up to hundreds of women being mentored. And last time we opened the program, we had 150 leaders, not just, we had other people, but leaders sign up within the first few days to mentor the women. So in my mind, that's success. That's success, it's, it's a big a change, so right? I didn't, a, I didn't need to prompt them, I didn't need to call them. Good job uh, in your role yeah, yeah. there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, Taking so advantage that's part of that of network the effect. There's an app for that. No, the network effect is a dynamic now. So coming back to the theory of, of socialization and social theory, as you get a network effect going on, there's a good social vibe going on. Talk about that dynamic. It's kind of qualitative, and maybe, might be some numbers associated with it, but talk about the, the, the network effect of that viral growth, if you will. Well, I think you sort of have a, it's now a, important and good and rewarded thing to do, right? But I also think there's a millennial factor there, yeah. right? So what we've been able to see is as our tech women come in off a of campus, they're beginning to get opportunities that change the game around women in the community, right? So we brought a number of two year, three year out uh, women with us and had them help us in the planning of being here, all the way from designing our website to putting together the booth to submitting and speaking at, so they got speaker slots, which gives them amazing Visibility. exposure, which then sends that social dynamic um, in a number of ways, right? You have them wanting to, other people wanting to emulate it. You have le leaders reaching out to me and saying, wow, we didn't know Emily, you know, Emily did that, that is great, right? She spoke to 900 people yesterday. And so that changes the social landscape. It, it makes does. it acceptable. It certainly does, and it's great amplification. So as, as, as we wrap here, Lisa, I think that's a great segue. Talk about the Grace Hopper celebration of women in computing. It's, it's a very different kind of, of conference. It's a very different kind of feel. Why is it important to PwC? Why do you guys invest in this show? And you know, the example you gave is just a great lead into it. Well, I think it, it's for a number of reasons. It's a great source of recruits, right? So, so we want to be here and we want to meet the young people coming off of campus who maybe we might not meet in our structured campus environment, right? I think the second is it's a great opportunity for our young women to promote and develop themselves um, and gain skills that we would never gain. And I think the third is just to empower our women just by being here. And even the emails I'm getting from our women who are not here and our men who are not here, the fact that we are here has sort of had a little bit of a viral effect. Yeah, it's a in FOMO, fear of missing out. People you're missing out, it's an amazing experience. Um, it's really helped put, in some ways, women in technology in a little different league, right? A lot of the yeah. alliances and a lot of the conferences we do are, um, we do 15 major conferences now, and we support leadership um, for women events at all of them. But this is one of the few that's not alliance-based. It's not being at SAP with SAP or being at OWL with, with Oracle, which yeah. are great things for us to do, but this is, for the women, about the women, and the development of the women. It's an exciting time, and we're excited to document, and thanks for spending the time sharing your insights and data and perspective here on theCUBE. Well, thank so you so much, much John been, and Jeff. It's been Appreciate amazing. having me. We're, it's our pleasure, we're so inspired, it's really awesome. And we, if you want to be part of theCUBE, we are hiring, we're looking for women, <laughs> digital <laughs> scientists, data analysts, on-air hosts, and you know, we've been shamed a little bit for having an all-male team here. I was just going to ask you. Uh, we are <laughs> looking for powerful, strong, smart women who want to join theCUBE, we're hiring. Um, so uh, <laughs> contact us offline. Uh, thanks for watching, we'll be right back with more live coverage here in Houston, Texas at the Grace Hopper Celebration. Be right back. <laughs>